Hello, everyone. I'm Luis Cruz, Community and Public Relations Director at the San Diego Union Tribune. We hope you're enjoying the fourth annual Festival of Books presented by the University of San Diego's College of Arts and Sciences. Welcome to our conversation on children's books with Henry Winkler and Lynn Oliver. Henry Winkler is an Emmy Award winning actor, writer, of the most iconic TV roles, including the Fonz in Happy Days. Welcome, Henry. Oh. And Lynn Oliver. Lynn Oliver is a children's book writer and a writer and producer for both TV and film. She is currently the executive director of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Henry and Lynn, it is uh, my pleasure to have you both on here. Thank you so much. Henry, I'm a big fan. I grew up watching you on TV, and now I'm a fan of Lynn's uh, after reading these books. Uh, you are the authors of the New York Times bestseller, Alien Superstar, a new out of this world middle grade book series filled, uh, it's filled with many lessons. And I'm gonna let you discuss this very cool project and then I will rejoin you in about 25 minutes or so and I'll return when we open up for questions. So those in the audience, if you have questions, make sure to put them in the Q&A field on the bottom uh, right hand portion of your screen. There's a little tab that says Q&A. So I will let uh, Henry and Lynn take it away from here. Luis, thank you. Uh, just so there's no confusion, I'm Henry. <laughs> that means, by process of elimination, I'm Lynn. And not only am I Lynn, I'm in San Diego at this very moment. I live in Los Angeles, but our family has taken a week vacation on Mission Bay in San Diego. So you, have, you live in a very beautiful place. Now, I have never seen color in your hair. Oh. You have a beautiful purple statement. Well, thank you very much. I'm here on vacation with my two sons and a daughter-in-law and my two grandchildren. And one of my grandchildren, whose name is Aeneris, is my makeup and hair consultant for the day. And this was her touch. Doesn't it look professional? It does, and it gives you, it really gives you a zip. Thank you. <laughs> thank and you. How old is Aeneris? Aeneris is just turned eight. Oh, eight. And she has what she calls the Aeneris flare and you can see it exhibited <laughs> in this. And last time I saw you, you looked like you had just come down from the mountain. You had a full uh, Moses beard. I did, I did. I, I felt like Spartacus's dad. <laughs> uh, and then uh, last Saturday, one week ago, my face felt so heavy. Uh -huh. uh, and um, I just uh, shaved it off. No fur, you're, you're furless. I'm furless. <laughs> well, you look good. It looks like the Henry Winkler we all know and love. Thank you. So, you know, I just want to say we're so happy to be here. And we thought we would just tell you a little story about who we are and how we got together. Uh, so the first slide is us. And then, oh, there it is. It's New York City. That is a Central Park and the west side of New York. And I was born on the west side. That's the Washington Bridge that connects New York to New Jersey. Next slide. And I have been learning challenged uh, my entire life. You, it is hereditary. Uh, and so they thought, you know, he has trouble reading. He has trouble with everything. We're going to put his name on his tie. And of course, when I looked down, I saw the word heavy. <laughs> Slide. Now, I've always wanted to be an actor ever since I was old enough to reason. And here I am in one of my first roles as happy. I was called stupid, but I was happy. So I, th there you go. That's one of my, my first appearances on stage at summer camp. Slide. Henry, did you get to pick which dwarf you wanted to be? You know what? I don't think so. I tried out for all of them and wound <laughs> up with happy. <laughs> well, that's good. That was a good result. Well, while Henry was being born in New York, I was being born in Burbank, California. There I am in my baby carriage, and no, those are not soccer balls in my cheeks, that is human flesh. I had a hearty appetite as a baby. And the thing that Burbank is most well known for is it is the home of Bob's Big Boy. I don't know if it ever came down here to San Diego, but it was the original double deck hamburger and still remains right up there with the best hamburgers in the world. Slide. Okay, 
Oh, cute. And here, thank you, thank you. That's me uh, when I was about two and a half years old. And the reason I put this slide in is it, it chronicles my beginnings as a writer. So we all know that all great novels at their heart have a secret, right? We read novels to find out what the secret is. And I must have known that intuitively then because I rode up and down the neighborhood on my tricycle giving and telling secrets and hearing secrets from the neighbors. Every day I would knock at the door and say, of everyone on the block and say, you wanna know what happened in my house today? And then I would tell all the family secrets, no, no stone left unturned. Uh, what, were, what was one of those secrets? Well, for instance, everyone knew that my mother's hair was not naturally blonde. Ah. For instance, everyone knew when my father changed his razor blades with shaving. What did he sleep in? Well, they knew uh, very, various things from nothing to everything. And, uh, and on which nights they knew that. So that's what I was sharing with the neighborhood. And what was amazing is in turn, they would tell me their secrets. So that was my beginning as a writer. It was being curious about people and then turning that curiosity into stories. And I had a weird hairdo then as well as now. Slide. Okay, so uh, my parents were very short Germans and um, my father wanted me to take over the family business. He said, why do you think I brought it over here from Germany? I said, besides being chased by the Nazis, Dad, was there a bigger reason than that? And so here is the wood that uh, he wanted me to buy and sell. It's just a lovely family portrait of wood <laughs> that, that was the forest at one time. The only wood I was interested in, slide, was Hollywood, except that I am uh, dyslexic. Uh, I was very bad in every subject. I was told I would never achieve. I was told I would never make myself into anything. So I wanted to go to Hollywood. They said, you will never get there. Slide. Now, I got here. Uh, and I got here in 1973, September 18th, 2.45 in the afternoon to be exact. And uh, I got the Mary Tyler Moore show within a week of arriving in California. I had four lines. And then I tried out for a brand new show. And I got it. I couldn't believe it. I was living my dream, a dream I had since I was seven. And uh, I, uh, I went to the studio and we were on the set first day. They said, go to the mirror, comb your hair. I said, you know what? I made a deal with myself. Every actor that played a part like this, comb their hair. I'm not going to do that. The director said, you know what? It's written that you're supposed to go to the mirror, comb your hair, go to the mirror, comb your hair. So I did. I pulled out the comb and I... Hey, I don't have to, because look at that, it's perfect. <laughs> I improvised just in, in the moment. And because uh, it, it was hard to be cool in a McGregor golf jacket, that's for sure. And that moment defined uh, my entire character for the next 10 years. For 10 years, I went, hey. And then I added a word, whoa, which <laughs> came from my favorite sport at the time, which was horseback riding. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 1980, uh, I, I took my jacket. Oh, I finally could wear leather because Gary Marshall went to ABC and said, oh my goodness, if, he, if the Fonz wear, rides a motorcycle and falls over, he could be hyped. <laughs> so ABC let me wear leather only when I was in a scene with my bike, which eventually they got over. But look who's behind me, the short Germans who didn't want me to be an actor. Now, all of a sudden, they're the co-producers of Henley Winkler. <laughs> I didn't need them to be, fam uh, to, to be proud of me when I figured out how to um, make a, a living for myself. I needed them to be proud of me when I was so failing in school, when I just couldn't figure anything out. At that time, I saw my life as a, 
a cylinder of, of stainless steel with no handholds, no footholds. And I tried to climb up to the sky, to the sun, and I kept slipping down. That's when I needed them to be proud of me, not at the Smithsonian. And that is my lovely wife, Stacy, of uh, 42 years, uh, sitting next to me. Slide. Oh, well, there, there I am, of course, surrounded by two big feet, as, as, a, as one does. So while Henry was becoming famous as an actor, I was pursuing my childhood dream of wanting to be a writer. Ever since I can remember, I wanted to tell stories. And so I went, I went to high school and was a reporter. I went to college and was editor of the newspaper. And then when I got out, I became uh, a comedy writer, and I worked at Universal studios and one of the shows i produced was called harry and the hendersons and there i am with with uh two yeti also known as big feet uh next slide and i thought perhaps uh you might want to see a picture of a bigfoot in a yellow rain slicker so there he is there's harry in a rain slicker that uh costume that creature was made by a man named rick baker who also did uh, gremlins and a very famous sort of uh, creator, costumer, and monster creator in Hollywood. And the 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 uh, costume cost over three million dollars. It was hand knotted in Sweden. It was engineered with all kinds of mechanical servos to control the face, and it was air conditioned because it weighed fifty pounds. So the man, the actor who played Harry inside of that, Kevin Peter Hall. Uh, would sweat off 20 pounds in, you know, in one rehearsal. So it was air conditioned. It was very, very high tech. And um, now, by the way, that costume has become so famous and so groundbreaking that guess where it is? Where is it? it it's in the Smithsonian down the hall from your leather jacket. Ah. So um, Henry and I had not Who yet cares? met. Do think it wears my leather jacket? I, who knows what goes on in the Smithsonian at night, you know? <laughs> Who knows, maybe they get in Charles Lindbergh's plane and fly across the, the ocean. But in any case, there they are together. Henry and I had not met, but our props had met. So next slide, please. Uh, and this is just to tell you that I didn't only do that. I, I've done many, many, written and produced many, many shows for television and features, all of them for kids. That's my interest, is I'm interested in family entertainment for kids. So I did the Wayside School series for Nickelodeon. I did a wonderful film called Finding Buck McHenry for Showtime that stars the great Aussie Davis and, and Ruby Dee. I produced Corduroy Bear, which is my favorite picture book for PBS, and The Trumpet of the Swan, which was written by E.B. White, uh, who wrote Charlotte's Web. So my interest is always in creating excellent entertainment for kids and families. Next slide. So, I was told I would never achieve, and here I am. I've had the most wonderful time and still enjoying myself with uh, Bill Hader on Barry. Now, uh, we were supposed to start shooting on, um, whoopsie, the, the phone is ringing. I'm, I'm going to unplug the phone. It's Bill Hader. It's because it's Bill Hader. I'm calling well, to tell you you're starting tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> uh, we were supposed to start shooting March on uh 25th and we still haven't started and hopefully we're going to start in february for the third season and of course i got to work with adam and the one and only and and uh one of the great honors of my life to get a star on hollywood boulevard which is truly a, a part of the tradition of um of hollywood and henry what's that thing you're holding that gold thing you're holding up in the corner Oh, I was uh, fortunate enough to win an Emmy uh, for my uh, role on Barry on HBO. And uh, it was great. You know, I, I, made, I gave a speech and I said, I wrote this 43 years ago when I was first nominated for Fonz, but I never got the statue. The only thing that I wrote 43 years ago is when I said, kids, you can go to bed now, daddy won. My children are 37, 40, and 48. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, next slide. Okay. Oh, so there is the now famous fish. Which so was horrible. 
But here it is. There was a lull in my acting career. Who knew? And this was about uh, 2003. And I had a manager for 90 days. But during those 90 days, he said, write books for children about your learning challenges. And I said, I can't do that because I still believe I was stupid. He said, I'm going to introduce you to my good friend, Lynn Oliver, who knows everything about children's literature. We went to lunch up the street from Paramount Studios. That fish was just the worst. But we hatched Hank Zipser. Slide. So that's the cover of the first Hank Zipser book. What happened at that lunch is Henry told me about his childhood, how he was always frustrated by school, how he had a learning challenge that no one really knew about or acknowledged, and he felt thwarted and how it affected his self-esteem. And I thought that was such a moving story that we decided to create a character based on Henry's experience growing up, but not a, not a sad sack, because really it's not sad to have learning challenges, it's just different. So we created a character who was smart and resourceful and handsome and funny and popular and had a, a lot of great skills. He just happens to be bad in school. And that ca character became the subject of 18 novels and then 12 chapter books. So we've written 30 books about Hank Zipser. Now that is my real teacher, Miss Adolf. I think she was related. <laughs> uh, and the principal is named after Gerald Love, who was my best friend from the seventh to 12th grade. Um, and he lives somewhere in Pennsylvania. So this is our first book. And when I first saw this with our names on it, and that my name was up there, I, I, I took this book, I kissed it, I rubbed it all over my body. I absolutely, honestly, no hyperbole, couldn't believe that I was part of a writing team and there it was, a real book. Slide. So we work together in a very wonderful way. There's Lynn in her office. We have written every novel in Lynn's office since 2003. Lynn sits at the computer. I sit opposite her in an armchair. Uh, I talk, Lynn types. Lynn has an idea, she types, I wait. And then we argue over every word. La slide. So while Lynn is typing uh, her vision, I try and slip my foot in the wooden slats of her office floor. It doesn't fit, but I have tried. I am tenacious. Slide. Now, here we are arguing uh, in, in her office, and then uh, she tells me, Henry, you have driven me, slide, to drink. <laughs> And I resort to every writer's best friend, also known as Diet Peach Snapple. If any of you are prospective writers out there and you're having a block, pick up some Diet Peach Snapple. But have you, have you changed flavors? Diet Peach. Well, I did try raspberry. During, uh, during the pandemic, there's been a run on Diet Peach Snapple. Now, I, have, have the pandemic is over now? I've occasionally had to resort to raspberry, and uh, I can make do. The lemon flavor does not cut no. it at all. No. no inspiration there. And slide. So, our newest attempt. You know, first of all, let me tell you what, and we just realized this. I mean, we had a chat uh, just a, a few weeks ago. Every character we write, no matter how different they are, it always seems that they are the kid on the outside looking in and wanting to get into the party. But they always seem to be on the outside looking in. So this is our newest book. This is amazing. And I'll just tell you in a, uh, a thumbnail. This young man, his real name is 97262. But on earth, he is called Buddy Burger. 
He lives on a repressive planet, and his grandmother is the a mechanic for the government, a repressive government on this planet. She builds him a spaceship because at the age of 13, you see on his back, there's kind of like this trunk um, kind of thing. It is a, um, a sensory enhancer. And at 13, the government makes sure that it doesn't work anymore so that everybody is in lockstep. No one has a new idea. Grandma, Grandma Wrinkle, puts uh, Buddy Berger in this spaceship. He takes off, he flies across the universe, and he lands on the only address they know on Earth, Universal Studios. Who is going to say anything about a rocket ship on the back lot of a studio? And an alien who has six eyes, seven fingers on each hand, and appendage coming out of the middle of his back and is blue. They think that he is just a stroller walking around the, the back lot to entertain the tourists. So next slide. Next slide. This is a close up of Buddy Berger and you can see some of the details. The illustrator uh, worked very hard to get it right. We went through lots and lots and lots of passes to get him to look slightly human but slightly alien to be someone who's really appealing to kids who has a lot of personality and um, i think we finally achieved it he gets his name buddy Berger, because when he first lands on universal lot his name is all numerical and he meets a friend and his friend says what's your name and he doesn't have a name so he looks around and the first thing he sees is the cheeseburger stand so he says uh my name is Berger. And the guy says, yeah, but what's your first name, buddy? And he says, oh, that's it, buddy Berger. Buddy C, standing for cheese, Berger. And that's how he has his Earth name from the first thing he saw on Earth. Now, let me just say that we learned a lesson, or at least I did for sure. And that is when you're writing a book and you have to work with an illustrator you might not know, you cannot settle, Lynn and I, are I think um, well I uh, are pretty lovely about it, but we keep going back to the the editor to the publisher and we say this is not it this is not our vision and finally you get it the alien has to be uh, strange looking but at the same time lovable uh, you know accessible because he does have to make friends on the earth. And for those of you in the audience who might be interested in, in creating children's books, unless you are an artist, you don't create the illustrations. You write the story and the publisher hires the illustrator. Our illustrator is a man named Ethan Nicole, and he's done a very good job, and he's a very patient soul, because as Henry said, we've been very exacting about trying to get the character and the feeling just right. Slide. Well, there we are, there I am at Universal Studios where I worked, the Harry and the Henderson show that I produced uh, and several of the others were all shot at Universal Studios. So when Henry and I were coming up with the idea for our next book series, we thought it's great to write what you know. So I've spent a great deal of my life on sound stages at Universal. Henry has spent a great deal of his life on sound stages at, where was Happy Days then? Henry, uh, Henry, stage 19. The same stage where Lucille Ball invented the three camera comedy. Oh, is that right? How interesting. I never knew that. So when you're writing what you know, you, you look to your own life. So in my own life, I worked at Universal. Henry was at Paramount. We were on sound stages. It's a very exciting world when you're making a situation comedy. And so we use that as, a, as a, the basis for our book because Buddy Berger becomes the star of a situation comedy playing, guess what? An alien. And, and he's, got the, he's got the costume. They don't even have to build him a costume. <laughs> That's right, he does. What is really interesting about this picture is that there's Frankenstein. And we created a stroller, one, uh, an actor who walks around in a costume and takes pictures with all of the visitors to the park. And he is, Frankenstein and Frankenstein the uh, uh, is Luis Ramirez and 
Luis asks Buddy what his name is. So now, um, and, and there he is on the sign. Yeah, if you go to the next slide, I think we'll meet Frankenstein. There he is. There he is. Frankenstein, and he is, he is actually one of the characters that was created at the Universal Studios lot. And if you go there, you will see him. So, uh, so you can imagine if you have that character walking around and next to him is a cobalt blue alien with, with uh, six eyes, it all seems pretty normal. So next, next slide. And that is the stage. Stage 42 is where we actually shot Harry and the Hendersons, all 72 episodes. And so the, the sitcom that Buddy Berger stars in and becomes a phenomenon in is shot on stage 42 at Universal. Another, another uh, part of life imitating art, including his meteoric rise, which Henry experienced from when, I believe Henry, when you were first cast in Happy Days, you weren't the star of the show, were no, you? No, I had, I had six lines and then it, it kind of grew from there. But the, the, the important thing is, uh, uh, Lynn and I, we, we write comedy because we believe that comedy is the gateway to the reluctant reader, um, especially boys who uh, don't enjoy reading a lot. But the other thing is that we want to be the book they read, not because they have to, not because it's assigned, but because they're having fun. And the other thing that is important to us is the underpinning under the comedy. And, and on, uh, uh, for this uh, particular book, The Alien Superstar, the underpinnings are... Oh, were you waiting for me? I was. Well, uh, the, <laughs> the underpinnings are knowing who you are on the inside and not being so concerned with the outside. Body, body shaming, body image is, is an important uh, theme. Knowing who you are and not judging someone else by their appearance. And also uh, being free to be creative, to be an individual, to be yourself. And to, we're always anti-bullying. That's a, that's a consistent theme in all our work. And as Henry said, we write about the outsider kid. And the reason we write about him is because those kids turn out to be really interesting. And often they have a tough time in childhood. So we're yeah, on the I, I felt that way growing up because I went to a private school for boys, McBurney School for Boys. I wore a, a blue blazer, gray slacks, a tie every day. But I was in the bottom third of my class. Uh, I literally took geometry for four years, same course. Uh, the only thing is I finally passed it with a D minus. And from that day in 1963 until today, no one has ever said hypotenuse to me. But be that as it may, I was the kid always trying to like be on the in crowd, and I was always um, uh, just frustrated. So, Next slide. so as Henry said, underneath all of our comedy and all of our high concept and adventure stories, there are themes, and one of them is to embrace everybody's differences. We believe that people are are lovable because of their differences, not in spite of their differences. Next slide. Uh, and laughter is a theme, God knows in these days particularly, we all need to laugh, kids especially. So we write comedy first. We always say to each other, if we're not laughing when we write it, then it doesn't go in the book. Right, and the other thing is, what is amazing is that the, the letters that we get from the kids and from parents saying, I walk by my kid's room, I open the door, and he or she was laughing, reading a book that's never happened in our house. Or the kid writes, how did you know me so well? Because we write what we know. And next slide. Uh, oh, this is a very good slide because this is the cover of the second book in the Superstar series. October 10th. <laughs> yeah, it comes out October 10th. Sure. And by the way, you can pre-order it at your local bookstore, your independent bookstore, or on Amazon. It's available for pre-order now. And it's wow. the second in the series. The, the uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's right, I was done. Uh, the alien, you know, is here. He got a job. He's, he has friends. But 
the repressive government cannot have people escaping that planet. So he sends uh, the uh, stormtroopers down to Earth in order to kidnap Buddy Berger and take him back. I believe if you go to the next slide, you might meet her. There she is. Her name is Citizen Cruel. And I think her name uh, tells the whole story. She is Santa, she's a shapeshifter. She can assume the shape of any human and she comes to Earth to pursue Buddy. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that one of the places she finds him on the back lot of Universal. And there are lots of real exciting action sequences where she's chasing him around the back lot. In this case, she's running by the uh, churro stand, the pizza stand, the nacho stand, and the strawberry ice cream stand. I guess we might have been hungry the day we wrote that scene. Ah! And also, let me just say, this is very important. They on that planet are allergic to strawberries. You know, uh, uh, oh, oh, that's the last frame of the book. Citizen Cruel has her long fingernails coming out of the box that she is contained in and you hear scratching on the cement of her cell. Book three. So uh, I think that ends our slideshow, our presentation, and now we get to just see our big old faces again. There we are, hi. Hi. Luis, nice to see you. So we thought we, that gave a little overview of why we write for kids, of how we write, and what we're writing. Right. So we would love if you have questions or if any members of the audience have questions, we would be really so happy to have a dialogue. Yes. Lynn and Henry, before we get to the questions, I just want to say I love this story of this young space alien who has this great relationship with his grandmother. She taught him about movies and television and arts and music. And then she sends him off to have a better life and recognizes, and then he recognizes the sacrifices that she made so he can have a better life. That's uh, right. It's a, it, is a, it is a generational story. And it's also a story about repressive governments because uh, one of the things that happens when a, when, a, when, a, when a bad government takes control, the first thing they do is they try and curtail the arts because the artists are disruptors, right? They're the ones who have writers, artists, musicians. They're the ones who have ideas that are not necessarily the norm. So it has a little bit of social commentary in there as well, but certainly the, the warmth of family is a major theme in all of our books. And the other thing is, there are two things about what Lynn just said that came to my mind. One is I never had grandparents. Uh, they unfortunately were lost in the war in Germany. So we wrote with uh, Hank Zipser, a grandfather who I dreamt of having, and he is, uh, and in, in, in Alien Superstar, uh, Buddy is always trying to contact and worrying about his grandmother. Well, it, it really struck a chord with me as a first generation Mexican American and, and the sacrifices that my parents made so I could yeah. have a better life. So uh, thank you for writing that. And thank you for naming one of your main characters, Luis. Luis, he was named after you. We didn't know you yet, but we knew one day we would. Well, I really appreciate it. Okay, let's get to some questions here. Lots of questions. All right. Uh, Ma Maureen Whitish uh, says, very impressed, Lynn, with your achievements. I'm an old nurse here in San Diego. I'm just quoting. Uh, turned 60 this year, wrote a great book that I see it on screen. How would it make it to a screenplay? How would I then get someone interested in making it to the screen? Funny thing, I have a wonderful daughter in New York City working at Trident Publishing as an assistant editor. She told me to find an agent. Uh, I work full time. I honestly don't know where to start. Any help would be appreciated. Well, first of all, the main help that you're doing in our society is being a nurse. So yeah. thank you so much. This is a this is a, a job of enormous importance and sacrifice. So thank you. Really? If, if you, uh, I run a nonprofit organization called the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. You can find it at scbwi.org. And if you write to me at scbwi.org, I will put you in touch with all kinds of resources that will tell you how to get published. How do we get a screenplay made is a whole different 
ball of wax. That you really need Hollywood agents for. And it does happen, but it happens rarely. But getting a book published is within your grasp if you're willing to work hard at it. So you can go to scbwi.org and it will provide you with a lot of resources. I will tell you that the one thing that you should do first is put your manuscript or a copy of it in a manila envelope and mail it to yourself. Mail it to yourself. Do not open the envelope. And I believe that actually is copyright your idea. It affords you some copyright, yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's go on to Jim Klein. Congratulations on your multiple achievements. Do you have advice for writers who want to be public? So along the same lines as well, we've talked about that. Anything you'd like to add more about that? You know what I would do is once you copyright your book, you can look up online the address of all of the publishers <clears throat> that publish the genre you're interested in. Write a very short letter. Uh, and send that book to every single address. There's a lot of stamps, but ju you never know. Somebody will maybe open it. Uh, otherwise, you'll just sit on your desk and that will be that. I have a, an addition to that, which is the SCBWI has an excellent active chapter here in San Diego. Oh. You reach out to them, and the best thing you can do is to get yourself into a critique group where you meet with other writers. You don't have to worry because they're not stealing your idea. And you can read your work aloud. You can get feedback because nobody, no one writes a good first draft. Everybody writes a crummy first draft. And so you can't get too attached to your first draft. You have to listen to what other people have to say. You don't have to take their advice, but you have to consider it. So I, I recommend, if you're interested, to reach out to the, to the San Diego chapter of SDBWI. It's a terrific group of people. They have regular conferences, you'll make friends, and there's nothing better, I think Henry would agree with this, than having a writer friend. It's a great relationship, don't you think? To write yeah, together? I, I, I would say it completely enriched my life. The other thing, that, uh, and this is the truth, Lynn, we, re, we rewrite before we send in the first draft at least twice. We read it out loud to each other, uh, and we cut like crazy because you, but so here's the thing. When you're writing, don't edit until you're done. Don't, don't cut your, your flow off until you're done. But boy, we rewrite a lot. You know what they say, writing is rewriting. Yeah, I, I never said that, but I'm sure somebody does. <laughs> Who does the art for your books? Well, the artist for this one is Ethan Nicole, Nicole, who is a cartoonist. He comes from, from the comic world. Uh, and it, Hank Zipser had multiple artists. The last one was named Jesse Watson. And, and the, the truth is, you're not really involved in the art in your work. The edit, that is the editor's job, the publisher's job. They take the manuscript and edit it, and then they search for the right illustrator. We have been very lucky that our publishers consult us, but it's not the norm. It's not the norm. And you have to trust that publishers know how to make books. That's what they do. And our publisher of this book is Abrams. And Abrams, their, I think their slogan is the art of the beautiful book. So they make really, they publish the Wimpy Kid books. They, they do a lot of very graphic books. So we have to trust that they know how to do the book better than we do. But we butt in anyway, isn't that right, Henry? <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> All right, next. Any thoughts on doing an animated series from your wonderful books? Yes, but that is also difficult. Um, but you know what Lynn and I do is we are tenacious. And we, we throw pasta against the wall until it sticks. So at any given occasion, at any time, with any conversation, we bring up the idea that these would make great animated books. And especially the, our second grade uh, novel, uh, which is Here's Hank. Uh, Lynn had the idea that once we finished Hank Zipser, 
who went from fourth grade to fifth grade and graduated into sixth grade, we would go backwards and we wrote him in the second grade. And we think this would be a great job, but no, no luck yet, but that doesn't stop us. Well, Henry, you should talk about the Hank Zipser television series. Ah. So we, we finally did uh, a Hank Zipser television show, but America, all of the networks said no. The BBC in England said yes. And we won the prize at Cannes Television Festival for one of the best dramas of the year. Uh, and I got to go over to England and play one of the characters, Mr. Rock, who was my actual music teacher, who said to me one sentence, Winkler, if you ever do graduate, you're going to be great. And I held that one sentence in my heart. And then I got to play him in the BBC version of Hank Zipser. Well, I, I love your story. Uh, someone here says, uh, is asking, do any other books address dyslexia? That's, you know, that's a great question. When Henry and I started this, it was really, it was a really new topic. There are s some books now. Um, one thing we should tell you is the Here's Hank books. Those are the ones written for second and third graders. They're written, they're published in a font. Do you have one of them, Henry? They're published in a font called Dyslexi. I don't know if you can see it. There you go. Which is, it was designed by, uh, by a type, uh, type designer in uh, the Netherlands. Holland. Holland, yeah. Who himself uh, was dyslexic and had dyslexic children. And so if you look at the type, it's easier to read for people who have dyslexia. So the letters are a little farther apart. The, the, the capital letters go up higher and the, the descending letters like Y's and J's go down lower. There's more, uh, there's more space in between each word so they don't merge and flip. So one of the things you can do is look for books that are published in the dyslexi font. Ours was the first, and we're really grateful to our publishers. I wish I had it when I was growing up because it really does. This font does make the eye and the page friends. I would fall asleep reading books to my children and so my, my wife read the book and I acted it out because I literally could not read uh, the normal print. Uh, do you have uh, children read your drafts uh, and children of a particular age? Uh, you know, we don't. We actually write for ourselves. And yeah. I, I, yeah, I think that's a good plan. I think, first of all, children are very... You know, there are all these studies that have been done where they actually had children, uh, they, they had people reading children the New York phone book, but if they were on your lap and you had your arm around them and you were reading, they were just as interested as if they were reading Charles Dickens. So I, I, I'm not sure that children are necessarily the best judge because they love the experience of being read to. So I think most children's book writers I know write for the child in themselves. Right. Oh, that's brilliant. And, and you have to do that authentically. You can't put a, 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 a glamorous gauze over childhood. Childhood is a complicated time. It's not all, you know, running on the beach and happy times. Children feel the same things that we feel. So we are very careful never to write down to children, never to minimize their emotions, and to really try and remember in our childhoods what was difficult, what, what was challenging, and explore that. It is very easy for me to remember, I'm 74, to remember what it was like being eight and failing and um, all of the, 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 just the confusion of wanting to do well and not being able to do well. So you have to trust your instinct as the writer. All right, well, we're at time. So we just have uh, time for a few more questions. So sure. I'll get through these real quick. Uh, Lucy Esplin says, thank you, Lynn and Henry, for a great conversation and for sharing a little bit about your childhoods. How long does it take you to write a book? Well, that depends. Uh, Henry and I work very steadily. We work only for about two and a half hours a day. We meet from 10 to 1230. And uh, because I think after that, if you get tired or you're, or 
you know, you're spending time in your chair, but you're not really being productive. I'm, I'm not a fan of, you know, writers sitting there for eight hours a day being frustrated. So at that rate, I'd say one of our books takes three to six months for the first draft. And then we rewrite, and then it goes to the editor who has notes, and then we rewrite on the editor's notes. And then usually it goes back to the editor for a polish, and then we polish it up. So probably the whole process is about a year. But getting out the first draft is three, four, five, six months, depending on if Henry's shooting a show or, or uh, we have other plans. Donna Abate has a comment. You two are the perfect collaborators. Yay to you two, creative geniuses for finding each other. Alien Superstar sounds like the perfect book, not only for kids, but for us seniors and kids at heart who need some sanity and a good laugh during the pandemic. Oh, yes. Here, here for sanity. We're, we're, we're voting for that. Yeah. Are you voting for that, Henry? I, I, I am voting for sanity, but let me just say this on behalf of uh, the, the two of us. To everybody who is watching and listening, we wish you health and we wish you um, just a, a, uh, the strength because this quarantine, if you have to be quarantined, or the stress of having to go to work if you have to go to work during this historic time in our lives is, must be mind blowing. And so we wish you only the best. Thank you for saying that. Uh, final question, and then I'd wanna yes. leave it up for you to have some any closing comments, but uh, this one comes from Nicole Tasso. What would you say to young beginners who are looking into writing their books? I, I, I'll say one thing. If you know you want to write a book, find time during the day. It could be you get up a little earlier, or you go to bed a little later, or maybe you have time during the day, and you just write a little, and you write from your heart. Don't write what you think people want to hear, what a publisher might want, what looks like success in the store. You write what comes out of your mind and your heart, your body. And I promise you at the end of the day, you will have a manuscript that you will be so proud of. I agree 100%. The whole, the whole secret of being a writer is to be authentic, is to find your own voice. So if you're just learning, if this was written by a young person and you're just learning, it's great to copy because copying is a good way to learn, but you're copying with the intent of finding how you are different, of what the story, everybody has a story to tell. Every family, when you dig into every family, there's drama, there's comedy, there's pathos, there's danger, there's secrets. So you need to look into your own life, your own family, your own processing of that. Look at what you said, Luis. You said you're your first generation. I'm sure if you were to tell us the story of your family, there would be lots of drama and lots of heartache and lots of comedy and lots of love. And so each person has, your, your role as a writer is to dig in and pull out what is moving to you. Right. The other thing I will say is let us imagine you're writing about your family or you're writing about a family and you don't have a good relationship with Aunt Rose. So you write Aunt Rose. Don't think that Aunt Rose is going to identify herself in the book. <laughs> Aunt Rose will not. <laughs> That's right. Oh my gosh, what a great character. Where'd you find her? <laughs> write the truth, even if it scares you to death. Before we go, is there anything else uh, you'd like to add? Uh, I would like to ask uh, when there's actually going to be a vaccine, but that's just me. <laughs> I, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for our, uh, inviting us. I, I would just like to add, as a, as a resident for the last six days of San Diego, what a beautiful, what a beautiful place it is, what beautiful water, what, what, what fresh air. It's, we've just had the best experience and so 
my best goes out to everyone in San Diego and to this beautiful multicultural community that you have uh, created. And um, and we we wish, as Henry said, the most important wish right now is is good health and for more uh, peaceful and empathetic times. I think the theme of everything that we do is about empathy. It's about putting yourself in someone else's shoes and understanding what their difficulties are. So if we had a final message, it's about that. It's about loving, loving this na beautiful natural environment, loving each other and being kind to each other. And taking care of each other, yeah. I agree. And again, the second book of Alien Superstar comes out. Uh, October 10. It's called Lights, Camera, Danger. Love it, love it. Um, I recommend it. Henry, <laughs> it's been a joy to read. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bruce. Henry Winkler and Lynn Oliver, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. A reminder to everyone watching, you can purchase the Alien Superstar books right on our website. Just go to our website, sbfestivalofbooks.com, and click on the bookshop tab. There you will find many of the books featured in this year's book festival. And thank you again to everyone who joined us for this year's San Diego Union Tribune's Festival of Books, presented by the University of San Diego's College of Arts and Sciences. These videos will be online after the festival, so make sure to tell your friends to get in on the action and join us on sdfestivalofbooks.com. Henry Lim, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Luis. It was a joy. It was a joy for us. Yeah, really. And very nice to see you, Luis. And great to see you, Lynn. Nice to see you. I like, I like, your, whole, I like your whole look today. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Thank you both. And thank you, everyone at home, for watching. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.